Hello everybody, it's your number one KUKA user here, Carl. Today, I have something a little different for you. I am going to be sharing my top six tips for working with KUKA PRC. I have been using KUKA PRC for over five years now, and it still remains my preferred method of outputting KRL to run on a KUKA robot. In this video, I'm going to show you some of the features that aren't as widely known to help you get up and running with the software even faster. So I hope you enjoy. For tip number six, I'm actually going to look at the six axis of the robot. So I've set up a quick little script with our KR10 R1100 simulating a simple little uh, KRL program where I'm just drawing my name with a tool that's coming directly down the Z axis of axis six. So we can see if we have a quick look at our KUKA PRC settings under analysis, we can see that I'm maxing out A6 quite drastically. But did you know that you can simulate that you're working with an infinite A6, which is a hidden little feature that not many people know about, that if you right click on the icon, so you can see if I click anywhere else, you get the output options. If I right click on the icon of the robot component, you can toggle infinite A6 axis range. So if I turn that on, to say that my KUKA is set to have an infinite A6, all of a sudden I no longer get my error, other than the one that I'm using in an unreleased edition of KUKA PRC. And it allows me, so if you have a tool that is coming down A6 like a pen or anything sort of five axis coming down this, you can set this to infinite and it will cure a lot of the problems. Now, I will also show you how you can turn this on your KUKA now. Of course, if you're working with a KUKA that has some cables or something attached to the end of it, you don't necessarily want to turn it on to infinite because you could damage something, but if you're working with uh, a smaller robot like the KR10 here, where we don't have anything attached to the end, eh, we can turn on the infinite and have that A6 uh, spin up and down as much as we want. So let's jump over into KSS and have a look how we'll turn on the infinite axis. So here I am in KSS and in order to tell your robot that you're gonna be working with an infinite A6, first you wanna log in as at least an expert. If you come to your main menu, machine configuration, now, if you're on a newer version of KSS here, I think I'm uh, 8.6, you can simply come down the bottom. You've got A6 properties of the axis and you can switch to endless. Save. And you've told your robot that it's safe to roll up and down past that software limit switch. Or if you're in an older version of KSS, you might actually just have to drop down to your A6 and you can find it here. Or alternatively, which I find to be a little bit quicker, is if you just come into your R1 MARTA machine dot dat, open that up, you can see that each axis is represented here and you've got a little comment by KUKA telling you which one is which. So axis six at the moment is set to five, which we can see is endless. And if we want to switch it back to uh, just rotary, so I change it to three and close out. And we can see back in our machine configuration that it's updated there as well, because that's where it pulls the data from. For this tip, it's more about efficiency. This is uh, a feature of more recent releases of KUKA PRC. So if you don't have this, I'm not sure if it's in the community version yet, but it's definitely for the members go to uh, the Robots in Architecture forum and download the latest build. And what you can see here for this script, I have quite a lot of travel from my start end position, which of course, if you're trying to automate something or you're repeating a task a lot, that is a lot of time spent wasted. Of course, there's reasons why you might wanna move away, but here we've got nothing in between. So you used to have to get your access values manually and enter them into KUKA PRC under KUKA PRC settings. If we go into the default, into the advanced tab. Now, Johannes has been kind enough to add in get current position for the start and end. 
So if we can look, we've got all the offsets for drawing the name. And if we move it sort of a lot closer, we can set the start to there, end to there. And if we hit apply, all of a sudden our script takes a lot less time to complete. So if we're automating some task or doing something repetitive, like cutting out uh, facade panels or repeatedly drawing or doing something like that, this can save product productivity a lot of time and effort. So it's just a handy little tip that I hope some of you guys find helpful. This is another quality of life sort of tip when you're doing a very complex robotic program or something with KUKA PRC where you're going through maybe a lot of iterations or you're changing some variables and you wanna save the output because you might wanna go back or just test a couple things. By default, when you're working with KUKA PRC to output your KRL, you have to go into KUKA PRC settings and in the settings tab, give your KRL file a name and then browse to any location that makes sense and hit apply. And then if we check the desktop, we can see that this is where our KRL.src file is exported, which is good, but you don't necessarily always wanting, want to be having to hit settings, settings and apply. But if you right click on the icon of your KUKA core component, you can have expose file name and save input. A button would make more sense for save and a panel called KRL file. Put that in the name. And now every time you hit that if I give that another name actually, just so we can see, okay, our file on zero one. And if I hit the save button back to my desktop, you can see now every time we hit the button, we output the KRL. So that's just a nice little one. Also, sometimes I put a C sharp or a Python component in between the button and the file name to automatically update the numbering if I'm outputting something a lot that I wanna keep all the KRL output files. This tip is more about the aesthetics of when you're using KUKA PRC within the Grasshopper and Rhino working environment. If you're anything like me, you often find yourself working with custom tools and many different tools that you've set up yourself and you find yourself using the custom tool KUKA PRC component. Now, it's a pretty easy one to get your head around. You put in a mesh into the geometry input and then that goes into your KUKA core with your tool input. But by default, you get a pretty ugly dark gray, pretty neutral, which works nine times out of 10. But say you've got something like the Shunk EGH80 digital gripper here, and say I want to easily be able to identify the different parts of the Shunk. What you can do is you can simply add in an extra component. Now, if I put a panel on my script, I can see that my tool is made up of seven different meshes with way too many vertices, but I'm gonna ignore that for now. And if we use the mesh color component before we go to our custom tool, simply graft both inputs. Put down a swatch or any sort of color input so I know the order of my meshes already since I set them up and I can simply change, say that's my flange, change that to a dark gray. And if I put this into our custom tool, you'll see the whole tool update because of course grafting, it will loop over and take the last one. For the shroud of our gripper, I'm gonna change that to what it actually is in reality, a white color. Then the third, I believe, is the Shunk logo. So we'll give them a bit of a blue color. Try and match their logo a little bit. 
Then we have our gripper holders. Give them dark gray as well. Duplicate that for the second one. And finally, we have our gripper fingers themselves. So what we'll do is we'll set them to a nice soft blue. Accept. Now you can see it updates to both. And since we know we've got seven, put the last one on. And if you want, if you're doing something a bit more complicated, you might even want to know which one's left or right or top and bottom. But for this, I think we're fine with them being the same. That's really useful because now we can look at our model and immediately tell what's going on. If we think about this in a bit more of advance, here's a little script I set up earlier. Really simple pick and place uh, with digital in and outs to control our gripper state. And instead of it being a static system, we can see as it moves through the program, I've simply changed our custom tool to a multi-tool state. And as it's opened and closed, I can have a view of the simulation and from a distance, if I keep it all in the viewport, I can see what the robot's doing. Without having to check too close, I can immediately see the state of the robot, which is pretty powerful when you're dealing with a complex script and you can quickly identify that something's not in the state that it should be. Tip number two is probably my favorite. It's not necessarily the best or even the most important, which I of course saved for number one, but at the time of recording and when this will go live on YouTube, it will either have just been added to KUKA PRC or just about to be added to KUKA PRC. So this is a bit of a sneak peek at what's coming up in one of the next releases. To demonstrate, I have a pretty elaborate script of just randomly generated points with some different movements, PTP, linear, spline. I think I have a circular movement or two in there as well just to generate something for the robot to do. And we can see immediately that we're getting an error. We've got collisions or unreachable positions, could be a singularity or something as well. And instead of manually going through and looking for the usual signs, which you can imagine if we're generating something parametrically, this could be millions of points. What Johannes has been kind enough to program is if we go into settings, analysis, and we now have a new little checkbox down here, highlight unreachable components. If we hit apply and exit, we can then see the culprit. So if we delete that point, say we don't need it, all of a sudden our script works. Or if we do need it, we can quickly identify. Of course, if you have all your points going into something, uh, into a single linear movement or PTP movement such as that, that won't be as obvious, but this is super powerful and incredibly handy. So now if we wanna just manually edit our point a little bit, we can see that it updates on the fly as well. As Grasshopper recomputes, so does Kuka PRC of course, and we can see that if we just move a little bit forward, our entire program is successful. I've saved my best and probably most important tip until last because it's not immediately obvious when you start out with KUKA PRC and programming KUKA robots, what information gets transferred from your KUKA PRC script in your krl.src file that is read and interpreted by the KUKA control PC. So this is one that I have to teach every workshop. I still get emails and questions regarding uh, why your simulation is perfect and then the robot does something differently. Everything here looks good. A student recently did a little drawing and you can see that the tool, the tool simulation with the tool mesh is absolutely perfect. The end of the pen is our TCP, the rotation, so the Z axis of our tool 
is coming up here. We can see that this is all being calibrated pretty accurately. Millimeter perfect, which is how we like to work. And when we run it on the robot, perhaps something weird is happening. Now, if we take a moment and we just jump into our settings, draw test, and we can have a look, pull up our draw test, as well as get back up our tool. The information that's going over in our KRL file that's been output by KUKA PRC, we can look down, we've got the, the program information sort of is always at the top before we get to our movement. The information in the fold, of course, is just a comment. We can tell by it's got the semicolon here to say this is a comment, but it lets us read immediately what's happening. And here under our FDAT, we've got our tool number and our base number. This is a bit more advanced for another tutorial, but here we can see that the only information that is going from our KUKA PRC script onto the control PC is tool number five, which is what we've set here. This, this number is the only thing that gets transported from our KUKA PRC onto the KUKA control PC. So if we look at our where I've already uploaded my draw test that we output from KUKA PRC. If we select that and we can have a look at our initialization line, open the fold, we can see that our tool number and base number is gonna be set to five and zero. So that if we test this script, press play, BCO run active, we can see up here that our tool is set to five and our base selection is zero because we didn't set the base. Now, this information as shown in KUKA PRC, if your robot's doing something unpredictable or it doesn't match the simulation. Now, in my mind, KUKA PRC has one of the best simulations of KUKA robotics on the market, hands down. It's why I love it. and. If something like that is happening and you're brand new to this sort of uh, working environment, let me just stop this, cancel this program. Tool base management. We can see that we haven't even set a tool number five. So when the KRL is pulling up tool number five from our script that we've uh, made, it's a null. It's just zero, zero, zero across the board. We need to add or calibrate a tool. Tool number five, and we can see that it's zero. So it's no wonder that our KUKA robot is doing something that is unpredictable. Now back in KUKA PRC, it's the exact same for base. If we load base number three, we have some other figures in here. We can see our script updates. We get an error because now it's unreachable. But if we run this script where we're pulling up base number three and we were to run it on our robot here, this would update to base number three. And of course, if under base, if base number three doesn't match. So here I do have a position three, a base three set for another project. If these numbers, if these numbers don't match, then our simulation isn't accurate to what's actually going to happen on the physical robot, which is incredibly unsafe. So I cannot stress this enough. But tip number one, when you're outputting your KRL from KUKA PRC, the only data that makes it across to the robot is this number for your base, as well as this number for your tool. So you've got to make sure that these numbers are representative of what's on the control PC and vice versa.